What's up, everybody? Welcome on in. It's the podcast. It's the Sooners on SI podcast, and it is back. Episode 242. Ryan Chapman here alongside the great John Hoover. Boss, how's it hanging? What's up? Awesome. It's awesome here in uh, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. I can't, uh, can't be any happier with how things are going. Yeah, Boss in Broken Arrow, America, just trying to get by. He, he started shuttling back and forth from Norman and Broken Arrow and all that as camp's gotten rolling. We've also got our guy Randall Sweet in OKC. Randall, what's up, man? What's the, How's it going? Oh, everything's great. Uh, football season is right around the corner, so, you know, it's the best time of the year for guys like us. Uh, we, we had hard knocks yesterday, and let me tell you, the second that the hard knocks steam hit, I was like, we're almost there. There will be... Real fake preseason football played this weekend, which means that college football is just a couple weeks away. We've been out in Norman a ton, gentlemen. There's been a ton going down. Practice is open. We've talked to a bunch of people. Dominic Williams, Branson Hickman, Brent Venables, Jackson Arnold, Gentry Williams, Javante Barnes, Jacob Sexton. We've been out to 20 minutes of practice, all that stuff. We'll talk about all that here in a second, but first... The podcast is back. It's back, back. We'll be rolling to you every single Thursday. So we record on Wednesdays, be in your feeds, hopefully Thursday mornings, as well as our post-game podcast offering that'll come to you. Uh, what is it? Certified fresh, trademark, copyrighted from the press box in Norman and all across the country. Uh, I don't know how much we really want to delve in, confuse people. Basically, here's what's gone down. There's some corporate mumbo jumbo, all that fun stuff. At one point in our lives, we've been SI Sooners. We've been all Sooners. We are now Oklahoma Sooners on SI, Sooners on SI. What does that mean for you? Not a lot. It's the same old stuff. Still who, still me, still Randall, Bryce, Ross. We've added Dakota Gregory, an awesome, phenomenal reporter we're excited to have on board. Uh, the biggest thing, boss, is just that it means it's a new URL for you to go to. Otherwise, it's going to be the same great coverage all year long, right? Easy peasy, man. Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com. How easy is that to remember? You got to go to SI.com, go to college slash Oklahoma, or just go to Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com. That's where you're going to find all of our great content. None of that stuff has changed. Uh, we've got a new distributor, new publisher, I guess. Uh, I mean, I'm the publisher, I guess, but uh, the people who publish our website uh, is Minute Media now. So uh, we're, we're paired with them. We're also paired with Sports Illustrated again. They have uh, they have jumped in there and they have embraced all the old fan nation websites and publishers and content. And so we're uh, yeah we're under SI's umbrella once more. Pretty cool. Yeah. So if anyone's confused by that, that a big reason why we haven't had the podcast is so much is changing. What are you allowed? Can't say whatever. Oklahoma Sooners on SI. Sooners on SI. You can hit us up on Twitter. Sooners on SI. All of the same normal ways that you find all of our content. And it's still all free, all that stuff, no credit cards, as who always like say, nothing like that. All of our content, all camp long, all season long, coming at you. So, boys, now that we got that out of the way, let's dive into it. Uh, this time of year, usually no news is good news. Unfortunately for Oklahoma fans, Tuesday night, news did pop out. Jaden Gibson, Oklahoma wide receiver, the third-year player, a guy who we had heard great things about through the summer and into camp has gone down at the time of us recording this, still awaiting that MRI, still awaiting the diagnosis. It will be a long-term injury, though. So the, the first thing off the top, who, what were you kind of expecting this year out of Jaden Gibson? What kind of blow is this to Emma Jones' wide receiver room for the Sooners? You know, what's interesting is uh, not within a minute last night, I was looking at, uh, I was looking at Twitter and I saw um, cornerback for, or no, sorry, running back for Texas. May have suffered in a preseason in knee injury, and uh, he's going to have an MRI. And the thought jumped into my head. I was like, what happens if that – it was like 9.30 at night. I said, what happens if that happens at the on the OU beat, like right now? I scrolled down like three three entries later, and there was George Stoyer from Sooner Scoop saying, Jaden Gibson's gone down, we'll have an MRI. I'm like, dude, did I just conjure that? So I hate to hear that. 6'5", 197 junior from Florida, man. All reports are that he was doing fantastic in camp, that he was going to be a, a that he had been a big presence and that he was going to have a great season. That's a big blow. Um, and you told me right before we started, you heard it might be pretty serious. Pretty I saw long term, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. Um, saw a podcast from Parker Thune over uh, OU Insider. He said if the MRI is to be, uh, if the report on the field and the MRI confirm it, uh, it's going to be 
a season ending type surgery or season ending type injury. So we'll see. I mean, it's, it's awful for him and it's awful for the offense because he was having such a great preseason. Yeah. Randall, it, it's kind of a weird conversation as far as what does it look like to replace Jaden Gibson? Cause he's a guy that came in with a ton of pomp and circumstance as a late addition for that staff in, in kind of their transition class Grew up a lot over the past, uh, from year one to year two. And last year you thought, could he get in the mix, get in there? And then as Andrew Anthony takes off, and, and really it became Anthony, Jalil Farouk, Drake Stoops, not a ton of rotation. That was not expected out of Jaden Gibson this year. He was supposed to step in, take on a much bigger role. So it, it's kind of weird to project what fills production that was not production that we could just copy and paste over from the 2023 season. But who are some of those guys that you're looking at as far as Oklahoma's wide receiver core? Because Emmett Jones, deep group on paper, it looks like, but not a lot of proven experience specifically at Oklahoma. Yeah, I mean, you you want to look at someone who fits kind of the same size and skill set profile as him. I think the, the first person that came to my mind was a guy like Ivan Carrion, a true freshman from Odessa, Texas, someone I've seen in person before. Um, he's got the, a similar size at 6'6". He's much uh, bigger already well over 200 pounds, close to 220 as a true freshman, early enrollee. So he's been in Norman since January, a guy who's kind of gotten uh, to get ingrained in Seth Luttrell's offense, kind of got to work with some of those uh, quarterbacks so far. And again, he's got a big body. He can really go up and get the ball, long, long arms. So, you know, you don't have to throw it at exactly the right point every time he can kind of make a quarterback right, even if they miss. A guy kind of like Jaden Gibson, who has some surprising speed for someone who's so tall, usually uh, you know, those speedy receivers are not guys who are six, five, six, six. So, um, you know, uh, carry on. It was a, an all state hurdler, I believe, uh, in the one tens during his time in high school. So he's got good speed, good athlete, good run after the catch ability, great uh, catch radius with that size. Uh, again, it's hard for, for some, for younger wide receivers, true freshmen to really break into that lineup, especially with guys like Nick Anderson still there. Um, but if, if someone is going to step up, you know, he fits that size profile. Zion Kearney was a very highly, uh, rated recruit coming out of high school. Who's also a bigger body receiver at six, two, probably all close to 200 pounds, if not over. So maybe he slides into that role, but I think those are really the two guys right now that you're looking at. Um, but again, with the depth in that receiver room, while it is a blow, it's something you hate to see. It's not. Uh, it's not the same blow to the offense that losing, say, Jackson Arnold or one of the starting offensive linemen would be. Yeah, and I'll just add real quick, Ryan, you look at a guy like Nick Anderson who kind of proved himself last year. Jaden Gibson uh, only had 14 catches for the entire season, right? It's not a huge amount, but 27 yards per catch. So how are you going to replace those 14 catches? How are you going to replace that 27 yards per catch with a big play guy like Nick Anderson? Maybe Andrew Anthony comes back from his knee injury, 100% healthy. Maybe Deion Burks is uh, as explosive in the in the SEC as he was in the spring game. But I got a name for you guys. What about 6'4", 202-pound redshirt senior from Tulsa, Oklahoma, played previously at the University of Missouri, J.J. Hester. Is it time for him to do something? Is it time for him to have some big con contributions at some point in 2024? Yeah, it's interesting with J.J. Hester because I, I viewed him and Jaden Gibson in a pretty similar manner, although for different reasons. For, for Jaden Gibson, coming into year three in a program, that's typically and, – and I'm not saying that Jaden Gibson uh, was not dedicated to Oklahoma or not going to be in Oklahoma for the long haul, but usually – how many guys do you see are in one program for three years? And if they haven't carved out a much larger role for themselves, that's a great candidate for hits the portal, heads on, stuff like that. So I thought this was a huge year for Gibson for that reason. Looked like he was taking advantage of it until the injury. J.J. Hester, another guy that this will be year three. Now, for him, it's been injuries that have really bogged him down and kept him from getting going. So a totally kind of apples to oranges, but in a in a same boat. I'm interested to see what happens there as well as a guy like what does a Brennan Thompson look like? He, to me, feels like a a really high-end sports car that when he's finely tuned and everything's dialed in, it's excellent. But you hit one big bump and the alignment's a little bit out. Is that car really doing anything? It's not taking the kids to practice. You don't want it to. It's also not hitting 200 uh, on a track or things like that. I, I'm curious, what does Brennan Thompson look like this year? Because in the two or three bits that he was healthy – Big time play and arrival against what, Iowa State, a big moment, uh, just connected with Jack Snarl there in the Alamo Bowl. Is he only a big play guy? He had a pretty crucial drop in the Alamo Bowl. Can he show that there's more to his game than just 
running straight forward down the field in the end zone. And can he stay healthy enough to do that? And then uh, for me, and I know Randall, you, you've got something here too. Uh, I, I'm just Jaquez Petaway last year as a first year guy. It seemed like he got caught in the trap of he was being taught one position that was behind Drake Stoops and Drake Stoops was essential to everything Oklahoma did offensively. Is he going to get caught into that trap again where they only view him on the inside, he's behind Deion Burks, and Deion Burks is going to do a little bit of everything, or with it being another year, is there more comfort to put more on his plate as far as what he can do in the entire offense? Does that give him some opportunity to get there as well? Because, Randall, I do think there will be an opportunity early on as Angel Anthony works his way back, whether it's physically to 100% or mentally trust in that knee again. That's what every athlete always says coming off an ACL. I do think in the first five or six games, Randall, there's going to be opportunities for whoever it is to step in and, and cement themselves in that rotation alongside Burks and alongside Jalil Farouk. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, we kind of saw that last year. You mentioned Jaquez Petaway. Week one, he had, I think, 10 catches, led the team in receptions. So a uh, guy, top 10 receiver in the country coming out of high school, top 50 recruit. He's a very, very highly recruited guy that it, it feels like if anyone in this receiver core, kind of outside of those top six that we've mentioned coming into camp, uh, minus Jaden Gibson now, if anyone was going to break into that out of that that second tier group, it seemed like he had the most potential to do so. And, and again, you mentioned who Jaden Gibson, 27 yards per catch, I think four or five touchdowns last season, almost 400 yards. There will be some uh, some yards, some touchdowns to go around with him out of the lineup. So, oh, oh you will need one of these, you know, you know, backup second team receivers to step up. So that way they have still that deep rotation. They can keep those guys coming in and out. But again, with the way Emmett Jones is recruited, you know, we've kind of talked about it. They have multiple options that we, that we think could, could be uh, formidable. Yeah. Unfortunately for Jaden Gibson, a guy I know that we all love talking to, he's a joy to talk to absolutely sucks. That's, that's the plight of week one of camp, right? It feels like whether who have you mentioned CJ Baxter at Texas, We've seen a major offensive line injury go down for Notre Dame. This is what every program across the country is rolling with. And, and the name of the game on that is next man up, got to replace him. So we'll see time for Emmett Jones, who did an excellent job last year. Let's see him do that again. And, and that's what Oklahoma is certainly counting on. Uh, boys, we were down in Norman on Monday. We got to see a 20 minute portion ish of, of practice about half of that was as they were wrapping up kind of their stretching and then a little bit of the individual stuff. So not nearly the extent of, of practice to draw some takeaways like we had in the spring, but who was, was there anything that stood out to you for being on the practice field for about 20 minutes out there at the rugby fields on Monday? It was, it was a little awkward, wasn't it guys? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. the, last year, for instance, I think we had four, including spring practice, four or five open viewings that were, that went, in excess of 40, 45 minutes. And when you get to see practice for 40 or 45 minutes, and these were practices, it wasn't just stretching, it was practice. So uh, when you get to see that much practice, you're able to glean a lot. Um, this was 10 minutes of stretching and about 10 minutes of individual drills. So hard to glean much of anything. Uh, the wide receivers were going through some getting off, you know, the ball type stuff and blocking type stuff. Tight ends were kind of just bumping into each other. Um, the offensive line was bro broken into, I think, centers, guards, and tackles, so three different groups there. It was just really hard uh, offensively to uh, to get much from it. But uh, we did see on, I think, the third snap, we saw DeMarco Murray light into one of the running backs. I'll just say it that way. I think you guys probably have heard by now who it is. But one of the running backs um, wasn't ready to take a snap. Fourth snap, um, Jackson Arnold takes the snap turns and looks and there's no running back coming up to take the handoff. So DeMarco Murray stepped right into the drill and started yelling at the guy. Uh, that's just a, another example of the perfection that DeMarco Murray um, exudes when he coaches those guys. He's extremely, extremely high standards. So, uh, and you know, he played at the highest of levels at the, with the highest uh, of results. So to see him be able to do that, um, even though it was a new guy, even though it was a young guy, a guy who's not played at this level before, right? I think Sooner fans love that kind of stuff. You are demanding, we are demanding that you be perfect. Um, we didn't get to see the wide receivers run routes. We didn't get to see the quarterbacks throw any footballs. We did get to see the new special teams. What are we calling him, coach? Special now that, the, analyst, but now that the analysts can coach, is he a special teams coach, a sp special teams assistant? That's another thing that changes NCAA football this year is the analysts can coach on the field. That's good for the kids, obviously. It's good for the teams. 
But yeah, we saw Doug Deacon out there working with the kickers. And it looked like, to me, to my untrained eye, it looked like Tyler Keltner was the lead guy. That's something that Brent Venables kind of alluded to at his coaches clinic that happened two or three weeks ago, talking yep. on, on the radio show. He talked about uh, Tyler Keltner, kind of the leader in the clubhouse. And uh, we could dive into that here as we get closer and closer to the season. I, I just wonder for like a, a Zach Schmidt, We've always heard he's money in practice and he's not money in the game. So I wonder how much do you have to just take somebody else and, and roll them out there and see if you get similar results or not. Yeah. But uh, Randall, I know that you were rolling around out there. You were focused in mainly on the offense as you're putting together your portion of the highlight video. Uh, what did you dive into there from the practice session? Well, I, I know that we'll touch on the running backs a little bit later, so I won't I won't get too much into them. But I also saw DeMarco Murray yelling at the same running back that Hoob is referring to later in uh, the viewing session. So maybe it was a rough practice for for that newcomer. But uh, I will say I did it did look like the quarterbacks were working on some interesting QB run options, uh, some things that maybe weren't in the playbook last year. Obviously, with Dylan Gabriel, we know you did a few uh, quarterback run plays, and and it actually worked pretty well, especially. Um, in, in games like Texas, I think maybe Iowa State was was the other West Virginia were the other ones I can think of where Dylan Gabriel ran the ball well. Well, th this this QB run uh, scheme that I saw had a little bit of a different look than what we saw with Dylan Gabriel. Uh, we got to see the running back kind of lead up through what would be the hole, and so I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know that they're planning to use Jackson Arnold. Obviously, Michael Hawkins throughout spring proved to be a pretty solid runner, but we know from his time in high school that Jackson Arnold can also run the ball. It'll be really interesting to see how Seth Luttrell uses that. And again, is that going to be something that's really a you know a staple of their offense, or 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 will it be used more than oh you did with Dylan Gabriel? Also, looking at the tight end position in our very brief time out there on the practice field, we didn't get to see the tight ends do much. But I will say physically, just looking at the tight ends, uh, Caden Helms looks the part. He looks just as good physically as any of the other guys out there in that room. Now, of course, with him, he's always been injured. Uh, we haven't really gotten to see him on the field at all. So we're going to have to see if that, you know, how he looks physically matches what the play looks like on the field. Can he be productive in Latrell's offense? You know, can he block? Can he play on the end of the line of scrimmage? Can he go out and catch passes? And again, the biggest question with him, can he stay healthy? Um, but if he if all those things are true, then that's just another um, you know good option in the tight end room. You know, aside from guys like Bauer Sharp, Jake Roberts, who have played a decent amount of football before. So I think that uh, there's a lot of there's positives there. Just looking at Caden Helms, but I think we need to see what he looks like on the field uh, a little more before we put too much stock into that. Michael Hawkins is the belldozer quarterback. Is, you, is that your prediction, Randall? Yeah, that's that's uh, right here. I'm calling it now. No. Uh, <laughs> I do think that, um, you know, it looked interesting, especially, you know, if you can get, uh, you know, Branson Hickman, Fabechi, uh, Noeu, moving some people in the run game, you know, the the quarterback run scheme that they had with the running back leading up, I could see it working well. It'll be interesting, you know, how you plans to use that and, you know, like the tough, hard-nosed SEC, do you really want to run your quarterback into the teeth of the defense that much? But, uh, I mean, I think that that's also something that you just have to, to acknowledge that you're going to have to take some hits, you know, regardless of whether you're the quarterback or who you are. Yeah, we'll talk about the O-line here in a bit. It's one of the, the major questions of camp. But I think regardless if it's planned or not, Arnold's going to be on the move at times this year. And it's really interesting. This is the first uh, season in a couple of years that um, you look at it and you have a, a legit backup with experience in Casey Thompson. Oh, he's coming in off an injury and, and everyone's very excited about Michael Hawkins and as you should be. But they've also got an experienced guy in Casey Thompson to pair with uh, whatever the um, – however far along Michael Hawkins can come. So that'll be really interesting to see as well. Uh, you mentioned that, Randall. It feels like there's a laundry list of guys. Caden Helms is someone that's like, you just got to get him healthy to the season. Sawchuck, Barnes. We already talked about J.J. Hester. We already talked about Brendan Thompson. That's kind of the fingers crossed moment, I think, for a lot of Oklahoma fans as you head into camp. That's what you're looking at. I, I spent time over with the defense, boys, um, and it it's – the two things that stood out to me, one, this is not different or new from the spring. It's just jarring to walk over to the Oklahoma linebackers and not see Brent Venables. It's all Zach Alley, the whole show. Now, it's just the individual drills. So it's not, uh, th there wasn't, hey, your alignment's messed up here, there, whatever. It was just Zach Alley rolling through some stuff of shedding blocks, things like that. But him working all by himself, having full command of that linebacker unit, is something we never saw, even when it was just individual drills under Ted Roof, because Brent Venables never strayed too far. So that that was interesting and different. And the other thing is, 
when you walk over to the defensive backs, I feel like I personally, since covering this team, have gone through two different versions of this. First off, when Alex Grinch came in, it was like, ah, this defensive back room looks a little different as he had his basically, you have to be X tall and you have to run this on a track. And that was different than a lot of the the 5'9", 5'10", 5'11", guys that that populated the secondary with Kerry Cooks and crew. Now you walk over to the defensive back group, and I spent some time just watching Robert Spears Jennings, Billy Bowman, Peyton Bowen, those guys go through some of the, the open field tackling stuff, which is really more to get those juices flowing and get honed in on technique right at the start of practice than, than about lighting dudes up. And the speed at which they close down and then seeing – the weight that looks like Billy Bowman's added to his upper body. Robert Spears Jennings looks like a dude that could be a thumper on the back end. Peyton Bowen, who I think everyone saw that interception that Oklahoma had clipped out on social media and all that stuff. But it's just been interesting to see the development of that group year over year as it's not just, hey, they spent more time with Schmidt, so they got more weight on him, but it, it's different kind of caliber of of safeties that they brought in. And, and they're, it feels like a lot of, uh, instinctual football players, which might be a little bit different than, again, not a knock on anybody, but he Lawrence and Reggie Pearson, the, the mental mistakes that sometimes would pop up, it felt like they weren't covering up for those in another play later on. It feels like Robert Spears Jennings, Peyton Bowen, those guys are still young. There might be some mental miscues, but they've got all the ability in the world, whether it's Robert Spears Jennings erasing a big play by coming down and hitting in or or Peyton Bowen making a big, you know, show stop and interception, something like that. Feels like they'll be able to, to cover that up, which is something that we haven't seen on the back of the defense in Oklahoma uh since what, 2009, maybe? Who? Been a long time. 2009, that defense was exceptional. Uh, and guess what? They had a five-star defensive lineman in the middle of the field who made All-American. I mean, that's that's what it takes. And now they're playing in the SEC, so that's what it's going to take again. I'll take your observation on Venables a little step further. That's exactly what I said on the radio that day. I did a radio hit for the sports animal here in Tulsa. And, uh, oh, man, not when, when the defense leaves the field, right, defense goes over to the other field and Venables doesn't go with them, and he comes over and crosses his arms and sits there watching the tight ends. He's watching the tight ends, how physical they are. They're working on blocking stuff, thumping, thump and run, thump and go, whatever. <laughs> it was weird. I was like, is that Venables? You know, I get my, my camera over and zoom in real close, and he's glaring at me. He's looking right at me. And I'm like, is that even Venables? Is it, What's he doing watching the tight ends? It was weird to see the linebackers coach, you know, the head coach, the defensive coordinator, the guy in charge, the CEO of the program, over there just kind of observing tight ends and not saying anything. That was weird. That was different. It it's a it's a different group and it, it dives into something that Peyton Bowen said last week as we talked to Nick Anderson and Peyton Bowen as well and Peyton Bowen said Zach Galley's let Britt Vittles maybe breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief because he doesn't have to do every single thing on the defense and should to see how that plays out what that looks like what it translates to on the field. I said, this- and I said it's weird and different. It's weird and different for Venables. It's normal for every other college football program in the country for the head coach to wander around practice, you know, station to station and look at all the guys for Venables. Those are some, those are some big boy steps for him to be able to say, I'm going to be the CEO of this program. I'm, I'm going to be the head coach. I'm not necessarily the linebackers. I got a linebackers coach. I'm going to send him over there and coach the linebackers. I'm going to sit over here and watch the quarterbacks and the receivers and the tight ends for a little while. That's a great step, a great step for Brent Venables. It's uh, it's not necessarily CEO like that's what Dominic Williams straight up said. He's not CEO like he's hands on, but it is the acknowledgement that he has to be hands on everywhere. He can't just be hands on with the linebacker. So if you want to see what we saw, Randall had a great video of mostly the offensive highlights. Our guy Bryce had a great video, of mostly the defensive highlights from open practice, as well as every single second of all those interviews that we've been talking about. Just head over one or two spots, Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com. That's the website. You know it. Bookmark it. Easiest spot there. You can scroll through as always, or just head over to John's YouTube channel, John Hoover Media. All of that is posted there as well. Boys, take a quick timeout. Come on back, and we'll dive into everything that's been said from all the players who talked to Brent Venables as we're basically a week through fall camp in Norman on the Sooners on SI podcast. Welcome back in. You can get us on socials. We do have a new Twitter handle at Sooners on SI. It's the same Twitter account. Still, still same situation, right? Same website, same Twitter account, just Sooners on SI. Or if you want to follow us personally at John E. Hoover, I'm underscore Ryan Chapman. That's Randall Sweet 5. Our guy Bryce is at McKinnis Bryce. And be sure you follow Dakota. Dakota Gregory D. A. Gregory. 
and you'll get a little bit of uh, Bedlam as he does a little bit of everything too. So you, you'll get uh, both sides of the state covered there. Should be good indeed. As we mentioned earlier, uh, you can find all of the videos, same place as always, Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com or at John's YouTube page, John Hoover Media. It has interviews from Brett Venables, Dominic Williams, Branson Hickman, Peyton Bowen, uh, Nick Anderson, Jackson Arnold, Javante Barnes, Jacob Sexton, Ginger Williams. I think that's all the humans we've talked to so far since camp opened up, which will hit us into our next segment. We're going to read the vibes here a little bit. If you're with us during the season, you know, every Tuesday, Brett Venables speaks. We have a ton of stories, and I write the notebook, kind of summarizing two or three of the things that happened in that press conference, the Venables vibes. We're going to read the vibes here. We talked to a bunch of guys. Uh, Randall, let's start with you. What, what's the thing that stuck out to you the most here from the past week is we've talked to a billion Oklahoma Sooners plus Brent Venables? Well, we've heard uh, positive things about multiple players in the running back room, and neither one of the players that we've heard of, about are the guys that were ended this ended last season as the starter. So we've heard really good things from Brent Venables, from Jackson Arnold, and from the man himself, Javante Barnes, about how he's been able to come back this offseason. I know you uh, wrote the story about it, I think, was that yesterday? Uh, recently, so definitely on our on our site. Um but Javante, you know, he said that he's been feeling great. You know, Brent Venables mentioned him speaking in front of the team. And so uh, I, I think it's really interesting. You know, when we were out there at practice physically, he looked great. Uh, you know, he looked really strong, looked like he'd been in the weight room and then cutting, you know, running through some of those drills, running underneath the uh, those pads and things like that. He moved really well. So that that's what really caught my eye about Javante Barnes was not only him physically looking good, because I think he physically looked good last summer too, but, you know, him moving really well. And so maybe that foot this summer, this time around really is fully healed. And, and if, if he is fully healthy, you know, we also heard good things about Taylor Tatum from Jackson Arnold from Brent Venables. I know we also had a story go out about that. And so, um, you know, he's another guy who looked really good going through those drills. He looked really mature. Now, physically, you can tell that he's a little younger than some of these other guys. You know, Caleb Hicks is another guy who looks really big after the offseason. And so, you know, maybe he does have to pick up a little bit of that strength. But I think between Taylor Tatum, Javante Barnes, hearing those good things, it really shows that, you know, oh, you might have some depth in the running back room. Again, Gavin Sawchuk finished last season with over 700 rushing yards. You know, if you add two guys in, Taylor Tatum, Javante Barnes, who can be good, solid options alongside him. You know, you don't know what you're going to get out of Caleb Hicks. Sam Franklin is a guy who ran for over a thousand yards at his previous school. So there could be some depth there. And regardless of who actually does end up being the starter, that competition is just going to make whoever does win that job even better. And, and I think that you're going to get a pretty good, solid, healthy rotation. You're going to be able to put multiple guys in the backfield who can get the job done and who physically look the part in the SEC too. That's what I've noticed uh, seeing the running backs out on uh, uh, what was that Monday that we that we were out of practice. So I think that uh, OU is going to have a lot better options in the backfield this year than they did last year. Yeah, on Saturday, Brent Venable said, John, Javante Barnes looks like his old self. That was an exact quote. And uh, after talking to Javante on Monday, I went back and watch the cheese it bowl just to see what did it look like when Javante Barnes was healthy, Gavin Sotrak was healthy, a really good Florida state defense. And it was the one, two punch that I know they lost that game, but we talked to Javante after the game, they were excited to show that last year. Javante obviously went down and we talked to him back in the spring and he opened up about that injury that hampered him. But I think the really interesting thing is Jackson Arnold talked about Taylor Tatum's a guy they've used in an empty set and what he can bring in the passing game. Gavin Sawcheck was really good in the Alamo Bowl, three catches for 42 yards, something like that, through the air. And he was a guy that settled Jack Snarnold down as some easy swing pass stuff, got him back on in rhythm. Uh, it feels like it might be another situation who where this could be no clear-cut RB1, the Eric Grave two years ago, a running back by committee, but this year it might be running back by committee because they're accentuating strengths as opposed to searching, begging, pleading for someone to take the, the bull by the horns in the backfield. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right, but I think we also what the point Randall made earlier. We're talking about all these running backs. We're not talking about the guy who averaged seven and a half yards of carry down the stretch last year. Guy who you know, 14 carries, 100 yards was his norm. Uh, 130 yards is what he was averaging at some point uh, late in the season. 100 yards for uh, for Gavin Sawchuk in five straight games to end the season. Um, I think we may be selling him short. He might be. You know, he's he's uh, healthy this year. He wasn't healthy. To start last year, um, he could be a guy that comes out. And the thing that stuck out to me about his uh, redshirt freshman season last year 
was for the first about six or seven games, we, we looked at the Oklahoma offense and said their longest run of the year is like 29 yards. And then Sawchuck came out and popped one long one to, to finish off the, uh, the UCF game. And I'm like, that's their longest run of the year. And it's in like week eight. So he took that and, you know, made it into kind of his, that was his kind of starting point. That was him in the starting blocks at, in the men's 100, right? Uh, he, and he ended up, you know, crossing the finish line at the end of the season. Uh, got his hamstring dinged again in the Alamo Bowl, but by all accounts, uh, he's he's 100% healthy and ready to go. So, yes, we may have a, a shifting, moving goalpost when it comes to RB1, but we may also have a guy that's already locked it up and we're just looking for a backup right now. Well, I will say, you know, about Gavin Sachuk on Monday when we were out at practice, he went first in every drill. And DeMarco Murray really kind of pointed to him to the rest of the running back room as an example of, you know, this is what these drills need to look like. This is what it needs to look like. And he was a guy who physically looked bigger as well. He looked like he'd been in the weight room over the offseason, too. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if we do get a good year from Gavin Sachuk, especially if he is able to stay healthy. You know, you talked about Taylor Tatum, Ryan, and, and mentioning you know, uh, Jackson Arnold saying that he could be used as a weapon in the past game. In high school, he was a really good receiver. He did uh, kind of play that role where he would split out wide at kind of as a slot receiver and run deep routes. And I think that you can really see where some of that baseball skill set translates because he plays uh, outfield in baseball. And so, you know, kind of being able to track the ball, the, that skill set, you know, from the outfield to the football field as a receiver kind of translates. You can see that if you watch his high school film, it's not really surprising that uh, you know, given how good he will at, given how good he was at that in high school, that you know we're kind of seeing the same thing through spring practice, and it will be really interesting to see how big of an impact he can make as a freshman, especially because he's not a guy who came in in January; he just got here this summer. Yeah, that'll be the game with him. He was the top rated back by what two four seven and rivals. I think he was the number two back in the country with on three in, in the final standings. But uh, an all around back, the, the big battle for him will be mentally he didn't get any of those practices any of that time with the playbook in the spring linked up in summer workouts to the otas now he's he's had what six practices in oklahoma how quickly can he get up to speed to his credit Tavante barnes said that he's asking all the questions in meetings brent venable said he was mentally equipped They're, they don't seem to be too worried about that but that always is the battle when you're a normal enrollee which is actually now a late enrollee the way that recruiting's gone so that's the running back room who what stuck out to you this week from our availabilities well we got to talk to uh to um gentry williams the returning starter at cornerback he started 10 games last year but he didn't finish 10 games um i looked up his uh pro football focus stats he only played 372 snaps last year and that's a lot. Sounds like a lot. 372 sounds like a lot. But when you look at the other cornerback, Woody Washington, uh, he, he, uh, 850, I think snaps for Woody. Um, so that tells you right there what they would like to get out of their cornerbacks. There's a 500 snap difference between those two last year. Um, he might be the second fastest player on the team behind Brennan Thompson. He's exceptionally fast. He told me, uh, you know, he, he's bulked up. Uh, to 190 pounds he's added 10 pounds of muscle and he told me that uh yeah i'm still running four two four three i mean we'll see when the combine comes i asked him low four twos and he said not nah, four three four two so he's really um excited about being 190 pounds having that labrum uh tear the labrum shoulder surgery uh fix his shoulder being back 100 percent being stronger being in the SEC, right? Because this is a guy, this is a position, you guys. If you got Woody on one side and you got a, a healthy Gentry Williams on the other, it allows your defense to do a lot of different things. It gives Zach Alley and Britt Venables some freedom to call some blitzes or some freedom to take some chances up front. And that's where those sacks are going to come from, is from the fact that they're actually covering dudes this year. So Woody and Gentry are huge moving into the SEC. But something he said – we we're talking, we we're asking about his shoulder surgery and we we're asking him about coming back and how much pain, how painful it was. His shoulder kept popping out and sliding out. And he said, yeah, it was tough. It was really hard. It was, you know, something you don't want to go through. But then the conversation turned to, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Peyton Bowen. And I think it was Dominic Williams last week, last Thursday, when we talked to them in the stadium, they were asked a question. So kind of led into it. I'm not a big proponent of that. Somebody asked, could this defense be the number one defense in the country? And I think it was Dominic Williams that said, 
he kind of offered it up himself. He said, this defense could be the number one defense in the country. Peyton Bowen said, yeah, I agree. It could be. So when Gentry Williams was asked that, I loved his answer. He said, I'm confident, but I'm confident that we have in the work that we have to put in every single day. We take it one day at a time. Number one defense in the country is not something we should be talking about right now. Uh, he said, it's what we can do to get better today and where our feet are. Somebody asked him again, a couple of questions later, is this the most talented defense you've ever played on? You know what he said? Potentially, but we can't live off potential. He said, since I've been here, I've had a good group of guys every single year. Really helped that everybody came back, talking about Billy and, and Danny. He said, that's helped, but this, this defense right now hasn't done anything, and they're just living off potential. So they need to play like it. That's a really mature answer, I thought. Yeah, and it plays into, too, exactly. Brent Vittle said the same thing that you you said, that you might look back and say, Jim Tree made X number of starts, played next number of games. He's like, it feels like he played four or five games. Right. Uh, I always joke that Jim Tree may have started a ton of games. How many games did he actually finish just because of uh, whether it be blowouts early in the season or, or getting hampered? But, Randall, it, there was no question. It, he was Oklahoma's most impactful corner when he was healthy. And it's just funny how football's weird sometimes, right? Gentry is a guy that Brent Venables is the first one to tell you, Randall, he played all over the place in high school, but it seems like he's really dialed in and honed in on those instincts as a corner. Whereas a guy like a Jared Canick, this isn't a, a knock on Canick. He's a guy that played quarterback all through high school. We're seeing there's a gap between instincts and learning the position. And, and I'll talk about Canick here in a minute, but it's just funny how Gentry seems to have married those ball skills instincts and, and it produced in, in a big way, especially on the interception front. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned he he was probably OU's best corner last year, and that's next to a guy like Woody Washington, who's played a ton of football. I mean, Woody Washington started for three, four years at this point. Gentry Williams, not only, you know, in coverage, you know, like you said, on the interception front, obviously the big one against uh, Texas there on uh, Quinn Ewers. But what I what I really noticed, and I think I said it to you guys on Monday when we saw each other, was he was really good at blowing up these like little screen passes, those outside runs yeah. behind the line of scrimmage. He's so fast. He's really physical for a corner, which is not something that you get out of every corner, but in the SEC, you're going to need that. Uh, and so he's really good at blowing up uh, plays that, that are run to his side of the field behind the line of scrimmage at the line of scrimmage, you know, taking on blocks, not afraid to stick his nose in there and be physical. So I think that you really get a guy who can, you know, play cut, who can play in coverage, who's not afraid to step up and, and hit someone, I think that's exactly what, you know, Jay Belay, what Brent Venables, what these guys want heading into the SEC. That's what you need. And, you know, you mentioned uh, who you mentioned that you've got him. You've got Woody Washington. You also bring in Des Malone, who's an experienced transfer from San Diego State. You know, can I walk her? Uh, you know, you mentioned you can't live off potential. But when you go out there and you see practice, like another guy who looks the part, he's big, he's tall, he's got long arms. That's a guy that if he figures it out, he should be a really good prototypical SEC corner. So in theory, you've got depth there. You've got some good players. Hopefully that rotation can keep everyone healthy. And I think that, like you guys said, Gentry Williams' instincts that makes him one of the best cornerbacks on the team. Who have you mentioned the athleticism? That that could you know catapult him you know beyond just one of the best corners on the team if if he's able to put it all together and have a good year. Don't forget Kendall Dolby. That's well, right, right. And then and, and you mentioned guys who play all over the field. That's another guy. You can play corner, cheetah, uh, kind of move, move him around. He's a very versatile piece in the defense. And again, he'll probably have another big year, at least snap count wise. Yeah, you talk about that depth, Randall. It rolls perfectly into my, the big nugget I took away from Venables on Saturday is he was talking about the the big area they have circled defensively is last year we heard uh, so much about competitive depth, right? And he felt like they did get a lot better on that front, but he did say they need to be better from their first 11 to to shorten that drop off of when they start rotating guys in. I think that's what bringing in a Des Malone to that cornerback room as well as getting Woody Washington back helps you with that. But it, I look at what can Oklahoma do with Jaron Canick, Kobe McKenzie, guys like that. Last year you saw Canick had those flashes still, still learning the position, ups and downs. That's why Kip Lewis, a really instinctive player, took over. But Danny Stutzman misses six quarters of action, the second half against Kansas and all of Bedlam. And you saw a little bit of drop off, not just in Canick or Kobe McKenzie coming in and filling in for Danny Stutzman, but Kip Lewis also having to kind of do it without Stutzman standing beside him. And then Danny wasn't quite right the rest of the year. The defense played different as far as stopping the run, things like that, that, that back into the year. I think that that's going to get tested 
wide receiver we always talked already talked about extensively that that's one of the big things that i think brit middles recognizes is if they're going to go through the grind of this schedule which we'll, we'll talk about here in a little bit the second unit needs to make that jump and close the gap there's going to always be starters and a drop off when your starters leave duh that, that's college football but how can you tighten that I think will play a big role in if Oklahoma is able to deal with the ups and downs of this season versus having some ebbs and flows that, that ends in a year that I think a lot of fans in Norman wouldn't be too happy with. Yeah, I think that, you know, you know, I'm a guy, I love Kobe McKenzie at the linebacker position, but I do think that you've got a lot of guys who, um, you know, the, the depth needs to, you've got a lot of guys at, at those depth spots, the second second team spots who in theory should be good players, right? We've seen flashes out of Kobe McKenzie. We've seen, like you said, flashes out of Jaron Kanick, some of the second team guys in the secondary along the defensive line. But I think if those guys can go out and really prove that it's more than just a flash, that they can step in and be consistent players on, you know, big rotational snaps in the SEC, that's what's really going to set OU apart um, as they head into, the, you know, the new conference. I think that, like you said, at the linebacker position, they've, they've positioned themselves well, but it's just, can Kobe McKenzie step in there and and take take a bigger role than he had last year? Can can some of these other guys take on more than they did last year? You know, like you said, at the starting spots with Danny Stutzman, probably Kip Lewis next to him. You've got solid players there. The guys behind them, how, how do they perform? You know, when those guys are off the field, whether it's for injury or or just you know a typical rotation. As yeah. we said, oh, go for it. Sorry, I was just going to add on to to what Randall was saying when you talked to the comments that Jack Gentry made. I think Jackson step down that road a little bit too about potential and this we have the potential to do this way the, they're saying that publicly but you know behind closed doors they're like nobody thinks we can compete in the sec nobody thinks we can compete nationally while we're in the sec uh they're thinking that you know those guys are you know locking barricading the doors so to speak and saying we'll show them we're gonna play with a chip on our shoulder yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. You can, uh, if you miss any of it, like we said, head to the site. You can see all those videos. You can also head to the site, OklahomaSoonersOnSI.com for our camp question series we rolled out ahead of camp, breaking down the big question marks headed into any uh, every position group headed into this year. Guys, next week on the pod, we'll break down the defensive line a little bit. We'll dive deep into that. But by far, the biggest question mark for this team is the offensive line, technically replacing five starters from the bulk of last year. Whatever you want to do with Jacob Sexton, he took over as a starter toward the end of last year, probably going to be one of those guys that stayed on. So replacing five stars, but also have a guy with starting experience. Regardless, there was a lot of optimism from uh, everyone that talked about the offensive line through this first week of camp who have simply put, are, are you buying this optimism toward this offensive line that has to come together quick? Uh, do I have to buy it now? I don't want to buy it now. It's too early to buy it. I would like to buy it later if that's okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm not saying I'm not buying it, you know what I mean? But it's still too early. Um, I will say this. I will preface the whole thing by saying this. We got to talk to Jacob Sexton. Y'all remember Jacob Sexton when he was a, a recruit, 16, <laughs> 17 years old, and he was on his visit, and they, they, we snapped a photo of him and his boyish face, and he looks like uh, Ralphie from Christmas Story or something. He just looks like a young, happy, fresh-faced kid. Dude is like six foot seven, 300 and something pounds, 310, 315. I don't know. He's got a beard now. He looks and he talks like your starting left tackle. Dude carries himself extremely well. So uh, we also talked to Branson Hickman last week. And uh, what I noticed about him, again, we're trying to judge their performance on the field by how they talk to the media, right? But he talked to the media, at least, you know, for, for a new guy. Think about it. Brand new. Very professional, very um, just – and by professional, I mean like NFL level professional, just in terms of the way he was communicating with people and the ideas that he was expressing and interpreting people's questions. Maybe it was a dumb question, like I think mine was pretty dumb. <laughs> he, uh, he turned it around and said, no, here's a great answer for you. And he answered – I was just struck by this kid gets it. This kid understands how to answer a question in a setting like this. So – if you can project that in any way, shape, or form onto how they study, how they prepare, how they meet, how they communicate with each other, maybe that then projects onto the field. And if that's true, if that does, if they if they play as good as they talk, then guys, maybe we st should start buying the OU offensive line. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Branson Hickman. I, I thought he was very confident whenever he was speaking to the media. That's that's yeah. the that's the sense I got was that he was really confident. And you know, you you mentioned 
Sexton, Jackson Arnold even mentioned that it's it's a, it makes him a lot more confident in the offensive line when he looks up and he's got a guy who, like you said, he's 6'7", 320, 330 on playing left tackle. He he feels a little bit better about it. And I think that, um, you know, the offensive line is another case of like the potential, but they have to capitalize on it again. You know, you look at the pieces individually. Branson Hickman did a lot of good things at SMU. Obviously, we've heard plenty of good things about uh, Fabecci. Uh, at one of the guard spots. Jacob Sexton's a guy who did some really nice things last year whenever he was put into action. Of course, he was young, he made mistakes, but I think that there was moments where obviously he he did some really nice things on the field. Now, you know, where you fill those other, that last garden tackle spot, you know, whether that's Heath Ozaida, whether that's, you know, um, Michael Tarquin or Jake Taylor at one of the other tackle spots. However, you know, that ends up shaking out. Even maybe a guy like Eddie Pierre-Louis, who we've heard from Branson Hickman, from Brent Venables, um, you know, a guy who's been pretty good uh, through his first few practices. Another guy, though, who didn't show up until this summer. Um, but can you fill those last few spots? Uh, that's going to be the real question for me, because it seems like you've got three guys at least who are pretty solid options now. What do those last two guys look like? And when those five come together, are they a cohesive unit? Seems like so far the people who are getting to view practice more regularly think yes. Um, but we'll, we'll see, I guess, as we get to see more practice. Yeah, the, the big trouble, I think, with this group this year is, is not even like an Oklahoma issue. Everything is going to be viewed through the lens of not only is Oklahoma in the SEC, they're playing one of the toughest schedules in the <laughs> SEC. Uh, we saw that in the coaches poll, which we'll talk about here in a second. Um, it becomes uh, this unit, if they were playing a Big 12 slate where you're worried about Oklahoma State and Texas and, and Arizona or Utah coming at whoever that was, I think you'd feel a lot better about it. Or if Jack Snarder was a second or third year starter playing behind a, a new mix on the offensive line, I think you'd feel a lot better about it. I still am pretty concerned about this group with first year starter. Will Jack Snarnold have the time for his mental processing, but the speed it happens are those two things going to line up? How much time he's going to have versus how much time he needs to put the ball in the right spot, all that stuff. I, I still just don't know. I, I think if you ask me right now, the highest ceiling of this offensive line probably looks something for me like a Sexton, Ozeda, Hickman, Fabecci, Jake Taylor unit from left to right. That that feels like realistically this year, maybe highest ceiling. I think it might be a year ahead for a, an APL or, or something like that. Uh, what that ends up settling with, with does Garen Hatchett, who's healthy again, work in there? Is the Tarquin or Spencer Brown? That I don't know, and I don't think Oklahoma's going to know here for another couple of weeks. So we'll we'll see how that plays out. It'll be something we monitor all throughout camp, obviously, as that's going to probably be fluid even through the to, uh, Temple-Houston-Tulane contest as well. So uh, it, it's award list sees as well, guys. All that stuff. We're not going to sit down and break down every single one. Everyone's on a ton of award lists. Today, the most recent one, Nick Anderson on the Blitnikoff award list. If you want to dive through all those, Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com. That's the place we've got all those up there. But I did want to talk about the coaches poll. I got something interesting. We're not going to rattle through it and all top 25 and who's higher, who's lower. Oklahoma came out at 16th in the preseason coaches poll. Um, you look at it. Oklahoma plays six teams on their schedule that are ranked ahead of them in the preseason. Texas is four, Alabama five, Ole Miss six, Mizzou 10, LSU 12, Tennessee 15. Oklahoma is the eighth team in the SEC when you factor in that Georgia's on there. Here's a stat for you, Hoob. I promised you a stat. You ready for this? It's good. Oklahoma, the eighth team in their own conference in the coaches poll, They've only been ranked outside the top eight in the preseason coaches poll five times since 2000. Five times since 2000 outside the top eight in the country. Wow. Now they're <laughs> eighth in the SEC. They've been inside the top 10 20 times over that span, inside the top five 15 times. Now they got to play six teams that are ahead of them if – the wizard season happened and they make their way to Atlanta and Georgia is the uh, opponent. And that's a game. That's a long way away. I don't, I'm not picking that, but they would play seven teams that started in front of them in the preseason poll. Oklahoma has simply never played a schedule like this when they've not been in a rut, like in the Blake era. Sure. Yeah. It, it goes back to what I was saying about uh, having a chip on your shoulder. Doesn't it? I mean, we don't think they're going to have a great season. What we say, eight and four, seven and five, probably better than seven and five, but probably not much better than eight and four. I think there's a there's a, a sentiment out there right now that nine and three is up on the possibility list for them. Um, that's more nationwide, I think, than what we've predicted. But you know, 
if they're if they're nine and three, that's three losses. I, I don't know how the fan base would react to that. Like, is this three is this three losses? The the fan base from a fan perspective, would it be three losses that we expected? Would it be three losses that we were supposed to lose, or did our team? Uh, lose games like last year that they weren't supposed to lose and, and left too much meat on the bone. Uh, but the team itself, when they look at this and they're seeing seven and five, eight, and four, nine and three, eighth in the, in the SEC, right. Um, eighth in the top 25 or 16th, I should say in the top 25, eighth in the SEC. I think that lights a fire. I think it can only serve to motivate them and focus them. Um, now they're going to have to do it on the field, but you're going to have to, there's some games Brent Venables has talked about all the one possession games that they're going to face this year. There's some games they're going to have to coach their way out of. There's some games they're going to have to quarterback their way out of. There's some games they're going to have to sack the quarterback their way out of, right? Get some pressure up front, make some plays on defense, maybe even special teams their way out of a game or two sometime. So when you project it like that, it's like, Oh crap, which one of these games are they actually going to win? So. It's interesting. I, I think, it's interesting. Sorry about that, Ryan. I, I, I think that, you know, the the thing that really caught my attention is what you said, who is, is this team going to drop a game that they in theory shouldn't lose? Because that's always been the story with OU, even when they were dominating the big 12, they did, they did. It felt like every year to lose at least one or two games that against a team that they were more talented than, well, now you're going to play a lot of teams who you are not more talented than if, if anything, you have similar talent levels, but, and you're going to play teams like Texas, like Alabama, maybe even LSU that have a higher talent level than you. And so, you know, can you take care of the South Carolinas, the Auburns, you know, those, those teams that in theory you should be. And obviously Auburn, you know, that's not going to be an easy game traveling to um, Auburn there in Alabama. So uh, can you win these games against teams that are in theory not as talented as you? Uh, can you win the games you're supposed to win? And if if you do drop one of those games, it's going to be really hard for you to hit your goal of nine and three even with the schedule that OU plays. And, and you know, you mentioned it in the last segment, Ryan, the offensive line, there's going to be a lot of talented defensive lines. OU is going to play a, some of the best defensive line in the country this season. So can that offensive line hold up? If not, especially in early games like Tennessee, when you're playing James Pierce, a guy who might be a top 10 draft pick, can that offensive line hold up early in the year? Will they be ready? If not, it's going to be harder to win some of those, those games like that. As this drops on Thursday, 22 days away from starting to get some of those answers as Oklahoma and Temple get rolling all right two more things we're gonna hit real quick before we hop out of here first one let's stop in with randall on the recruiting front my friend uh july was a hot and heavy month as always but oklahoma actually has a lot of their 2025 class had a lot of it done before july now we're we're kind of just on fasusi watch right the five-star offensive tackle from Louisville. what is it two weeks away from that decision yeah, two weeks from today, exactly. And of course, you know, throughout the rest of this class, OU will pick up commitments here and there. But I think that Michael Fasusi, since even this time last year, has been the guy that a lot of OU fans and OU staff even has been really keeping their eye on. Uh, you know, he's such a high level recruit that that's the type of guy who can really, you know, I don't want to say change the program, but, you know, can really set things in the right direction in that 2025 class. Obviously, you've got a lot of talented skill position players. They've added a few good offensive linemen. Uh, you know, Ryan Foje is a really highly rated recruit. He got a big boost in the most recent rankings updates. Owen Hollenbeck, Darius Off. Afalava, I hope I'm saying his last name correctly. You know, so those guys are really good. But if you can add the five star, you know, top three tackle in the country to that class, that's what really ties it together. That's what really makes it an impressive offensive line group. Michael Fasusi, a guy who, you know, we've spoken to before here, uh, here at Sooners on SI, you know, a guy who hasn't been playing football his whole life. He started in middle school. He's a soccer player before, in Africa before he moved to America in middle school. So a guy with a lot of athleticism, really good footwork. Uh, he's got the size, he's about 6'5", 300 pounds already. So, you know, you like that. Of course, uh, he would be the highest rated recruit that Bill Beatonbow's ever landed if OU is uh, is able to, to get him two weeks from today. And it, from all indications, everyone that I've talked to, it seems like OU's in a really, really good spot right now with him. Now, of course, uh, I think a lot of OU fans kind of get PTSD with these uh, highly rated recruits because uh, I've seen, I think we've seen OU be in really good positions with them before other teams kind of swoop in last second and uh, and steal them out from under them. So Texas, Texas A&M are teams to really, really watch there with Michael Fasusi. I would not count them out all the way until he picks up the OU hat. So uh, I don't think anything is a foregone conclusion, but I think right now OU is in a great spot with him. Be sure to tune in two weeks from today uh, to hear to hear more about that.
Yeah, Randall obviously have you covered there on that. And if he could knock off that, Caden Green is the highest rated recruit that Bill Vindbo's ever landed. I think Oklahoma Vance would be cool yep. with that. Uh, Hoove, we got half a week or so left in Paris. There were a handful of Sooners participating in the Olympics. Uh, how have they done? What's gone down there? Boom, 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 boom. Ba, 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 ba. Your Oklahoma Olympic update brought to you by Sooners on SI. Yeah, so uh, one guy's throwing right now. He's throwing this very minute. So uh, Rolford, uh, Rolford Mullings is the discus thrower. He is. Uh, he threw today 65, uh, 65.8 or something like that meters. He's in currently uh, ninth. Yeah, he's in ninth right now. Uh, this earlier today, which would have been in France, what, yesterday, last night, um, Vernon Turner, the All-American national champion high jumper, he finished 14th. Now, the thing with Vernon, he finished uh, – he basically jumped – I'm not going to give you meters because I don't know meters. 2.15 meters, whatever that means. means seven foot and a half inch. Seven foot and a half inch. His top jump has been 7'5". He's, ju- he's cleared 7'5 before. 7.5 is the gold medal this year. So too bad Vernon didn't have his best stuff out there today or yesterday or this week, whenever it was. But, uh, yeah, he had the opportunity. He certainly had the talent to be a gold medalist. But, anyway, finished 14th. Rolfer Mullings is a guy that completed uh, competed um, unattached last year after transferring from Arkansas, after transferring from Arizona State. So he still has yet to throw for OU. But uh, they're hoping that uh, next year will be his year. This coming year, I should say, will be his year. So – Two Olympians, still going. Probably neither one going to medal, but uh, pretty cool for OU to have a couple of Olympians out there on the track and field complete competing. And yeah, Vernon Turner yes. from UConn. Yeah, yep. yeah, local kid too. Not not just not just an OU tie, but a local tie as well. Actually, so. actually from Tulsa, but then settled in UConn and then ah. went to OU. So, or, I went to Arkansas know. and then OU. So yeah. It's uh, it's all over the place a little bit. Of course, everyone feels like it's chasing LSU on the medal stand as they just keep pumping out. Yeah. Not just Olympians, gold medalists, Texas as well, yeah. even the women's 100. But been a been a fun stint over there in Paris. As that wraps up, though, you know we're inching closer and closer to football, and you don't have to worry about any withdrawal, anything like that. We'll be back next Thursday. Again, Thursday going to be the new published date. Thursday morning is when the podcast will hit your feed. It'll also be on YouTube Thursday morning. Just look at John Hoover Media. The goal, the stated goal, is to have the podcast at least out for your drive into work on Thursday mornings. And then once the season gets underway, we'll obviously be back here as always with your post-game podcast certified fresh from whatever press box we happen to be in that week. As always, though, you know where to find the pod, anywhere you can get your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, all of that stuff. You can hit us up on Amazon, Alexa, just say, hey, play the Sooners on SI podcast, and we'll get all that sorted on the back end. But uh, for John Hoover, for Randall Sweet, for the entire Sooners on SI staff, again, follow Dakota, follow Bryce, make sure you're following Ross, all that stuff. We will talk to you guys next Tuesday, but in the meantime, be sure you're hitting us up, OklahomaSoonersOnSI.com, as all the camp content will keep flowing, and we'll hang out with you again next Thursday here on the pod.